This episode of the Northern Miner Podcast is brought to you by Revival Gold and their Bear Track Arnett Gold Project in Idaho. If you want to learn more about Revival Gold, you can find them at revival-gold.com and you can find them on the TSX Venture Exchange at RVG and on the over the counter markets at RVLGF. Breaks nineteen hundred dollars. It's at one thousand nine hundred thirteen dollars and seventy three cents. It is continuing to move higher. Welcome everyone to the Northern Miner Podcast. My name is Adrian Pocabelli. It's great to have you back once again. Summer is coming, and gold and silver are looking impressive. It seems like we're hitting a new juncture in this inflation narrative. The Inflation narrative itself seems played out. It's been repeated quite often. I almost feel like I'm in 2010 when I first got into this whole business of gold and silver. And it really reminds me of that time back then. You hear it in the crypto markets as well. It's the exact same narrative. Fiat money, printing, and hyperinflation, it's the same narrative, and it's it's funny actually how much those two markets have in common, but I think we're hitting a juncture where the prices themselves are still high. So now those people that are saying that this inflation is transitory, and I personally think it will be, but I think soon it feels to me that at least in the next couple of months, like these This transitoriness is going to have to start to prove itself because we still see inflated prices. Now, Kathy Wood of ARK Investments, she thinks it's going to be transitory, and her reasoning is quite interesting. She was saying during the pandemic, everybody's stuck at home, so they're doing stuff like working on their home, they're ordering stuff online, they're they're buying more material objects, and that the economy was basically skewed towards material objects over services and things like vacations, which don't require as many commodities. Of course, you need oil and you need food and whatever for restaurants when people travel. But that ultimately, the service side of the economy was not as represented last year. So we had a skewing towards commodities and material objects, consumer goods, and that this will reverse itself, according to her. So I think a very provocative, interesting, insightful idea and argument for the transitoriness of this growth in commodity prices, but it it has yet to bear fruit, though, this argument. So it really is a wait and see, and it's like, you might think of it as the Fed's massive gamble. Like they are gambling or they are betting or they are suspecting that this increase in commodity prices will relinquish itself. And I have heard some talk on financial news of how they are starting to talk about thinking about raising rates almost, you wonder if this is like a behavioral attempt to change the psychology of the markets away from this inflation narrative because maybe they are worried that it gets away on them, although I think they will be proven right in the end. Who knows? I mean, that's just a hunch. Nobody knows. But it, it is coming time for the transitory people to start to, you know, for that argument to prove itself, probably have two or three months, four months. And if prices remain at the same level or higher, that transitoriness, I think people are going to get pretty concerned about. So I almost want to call it the T word. Uh, It is the word of the moment, and it is at the heart of our industry what is going on with these metal prices. And let me tell you, they're not slowing down, as we see. So another exciting episode we have lined up for you. We have David Garofalo from Gold Royalty, and he is interviewed by our new reporter, Henry Lazenby. And this was at the Global Mining Symposium on May 20th, so very recent interview. And it was quite interesting. 
there were a few things that stood out. Big picture, the mining industry has never been healthier from a financial perspective. And I think that's worth noting. I mean, I was looking at the gold stocks here, and it's just a steady climb since February. So, you know, barracks up about 20%. Let's see, it's sitting at $24.08 on the U.S. markets. Newmont is at $73.48. You know, it was down at $60 at the start of March three months ago. It was sitting at fifty-five thirty-three, and now it's at seventy-five. So that is a pretty impressive move. Let's just take a look at one more. Kirkland Lake is an interesting bellwether for what I consider, I guess, a mid-tier. And at the start of March, they were at forty-two eighty-six, and they were at fifty-one ninety. So they're up twenty percent. So gold stocks. You know, we could say they have the wind in their sail. I mean, I look at Ivanhoe. That's not exactly a gold stock, but $8.89. I remember in 2016 when that was 30 cents. So that is a 30x. That is why people love to speculate in these markets. And that's why we have that core audience at the Northern Miner. I mean, there are generations of Canadians that read this newspaper to follow these junior miners It is a part of our culture. I dare say it's Canadiana. So that is coming up. We also have another Mining Minute with Hugh Agro, and he talks about AI and tech. If you want to find us online, you can find us at northernminer.com. You can find us on Instagram at The Northern Miner. You can find us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And wherever podcasts are available, including SoundCloud, Spotify, Stitcher, and Apple Podcasts, I struggle with that app. Am I the only one that's struggles with the Apple Podcast app, but you can find us there. And if you have trouble, you can always find us on YouTube. Okay, so we try and make it available everywhere. And with that, let's turn to our final Mining Minute with Revival Gold, President and CEO, Hugh Agro. Joining me once again for our final Mining Minute is Hugh Agro, President and CEO of Revival Gold, and Hugh, welcome back. Thank you for having me, Adrian. It's great to have you back. I've enjoyed our conversations over the last couple of months. And so you were telling me that you were working with a company called Mira Geoscience at your Bear Track Arnett project in Idaho, and you're doing some sort of AI tech stuff. Tell me, what are you guys doing there and how is it benefiting you? It's very exciting. Of course, there's a long history of exploration and mining on the Bear Track Arnett Gold Project in Idaho. In fact, dates back to the you know the mid 1800s. But uh, today we have these great technologies that can be applied to geology. And uh, Mira Geoscience is, uh, I like to say, the the McKinsey of the geoscience world. Smart, sharp guys and gals with really uh, interesting uh, technologies that they can apply to the geoscience data. For example, a computer platform which can bring in all of the data on our project, over 150 kilometers of drill data, geophysics, soil geochem, and with that, model that in three space, and then be able to apply machine learning and AI technologies to help our geological team uh, sort through this data and uh, find new targets. And there's some really interesting developments out of all that. So this brings you a real tangible benefit and something that you would not have otherwise. Yeah, it's a it's an unbiased approach to understanding the data as well. It's like having a uh, it's like having extra lifting power for all of our our geologists to be able to understand the information we have. And just as an example of that, you know, as part of our efforts, we've been able to now find a, a low angle uh, a structure that runs through the main Panther Creek mineralized zone, which uh, coincides with high grade. And of course, we've got we've got 71 grams over 9.8 meters in the Ward's Gulch area. And the question is, where does that go to and how do we follow that up best? And with this uh, tools from Mira, we've been able to now pick up low angle structures in the main fault zone. And uh, our team is bu- busy designing a, a drill program around that for, for future execution. And uh, that's just one example of the sorts of things that have come out of 3D modeling, 
uh, AI technology, this machine learning technologies uh, in our in our collaboration with uh, Mirage Science. And you're working on a historical property, right? Did you get data then that was passed down to you that you can also parse through? Or how does that work? Is that beneficial to you as well? We've scratched up data from uh, many different sources. But uh, yeah, it's this long history of the project that uh, is the reason we've got so much information to work with. That's both a challenge and a curse. Uh, the curse, because you've got so much information, you've got to be able to uh, sift through it. But the, the, the opportunity here is is really to be able to understand in a better fashion what we have. And um, and so we've been able to borrow from government sources. The Idaho Geological Survey has some great data uh, from our own uh, project work, uh, as I say, over 150 kilometers of drill data on the project. And, um, and all of that has kind of come together in this data set. We've seen th through the history here, placer mining, hard rock mining, uh, there's just so much evidence of mineralization. Now, 3 million ounces of gold at Fairtrack Arnett, and this speaks to a big gold system. And, uh, you know, I don't think it's a stretch to say that uh, we'll be exploring and, uh, and developing this uh, gold deposit for, you know, for 50, 100 years to come, because it's just it's got so much potential around it. We think the potential on this project is at least 5 million ounces of gold. Uh, we've just really scratched the surface. AI technology, sophisticated computer technology, borrowed from other industries and even advanced in the mining industry, exploration industry, is the only way forward to, uh, to be able to manage in a situation like this where you've got so much data and so much prospectivity. That is pretty exciting. And 50 years, that's incredible. And 5 million ounces is a pretty significant deposit. And so as far as on, on the tech side, is it then primarily used for modeling a deposit? I mean, I assume you're using tech across your organization. I assume in the exploration, it's the most beneficial. But are there other places as well that you're using this kind of AI machine learning? Or is it primarily in the exploration? Well, at this stage of the business, it's primarily in the exploration. But as you know, the mining industry has picked up some really cool tools over the last uh, decade or two in uh, operation of autonomous, semi-autonomous vehicles, in mapping, in uh, execution, understanding ge uh, geotechnical data, uh, the movement of, of rock uh, masses, in energy use, in the way we uh, we we efficiently use energy in the in the projects. So there's all kinds of applications for technology and in, in exploration and mining. What we've done with uh, with Mira is just the start for a revival gold. Uh, we are looking at our energy and how we might employ some new technologies around that. And of course we're looking at equipment as we think about our, our plans for ultimately mining at the project. Uh, but in the first instance here, uh, what we've done with Mira is uh, focus on the data that we have, three-dimensional uh, modeling, um, using these uh, machine learning techniques, uh, also using the, the knowledge and the skills and the understanding of our team. That's very important to the process, has to be integrated into the process. It's a data-driven approach that uh, has given us new exploration models. It's helped prioritize our, our existing our targets. And it, it's really opened our eyes to the possibilities in the project, uh, down plunge uh, and a long strike. Of course, the deposit's open in all directions. So part of our problem and opportunity here is uh, is just to, just to prioritize the number of uh, drill targets we have. Well, it sounds like a really well-placed project in Idaho, in the middle of the U.S. there. So, and for those listeners who might have missed our first two mining minutes. Before you go, could could you just refresh us on your roadmap uh, briefly, uh, just on where things stand with the company? Fairtrack RNet was uh, closed in 2000 when the price of gold went below $250 an ounce. And it was really left uh, unexplored and unadvanced for, uh, for about a 15 or 20 year period. Uh, we've come in and over the course of the last uh, three, four, four drill seasons now, uh, we've taking the resource from nil to three million ounces. Uh, our next step is a, uh, is a drill program this year. It just got underway in the high-grade Joss zone where we've got a kilometer of strike and 14 drill intercepts ranging from four to nine grams per ton on mineable widths in an underground setting. So, so following up on that, we'll do a resource update at the beginning of next year. And of course, uh, we've got a first phase 
keep leach aspect to this project, and we'll be taking that to a pre-feasibility study uh, by the end of next year and ultimately uh, a construction decision. This project's got uh, so many possibilities to it, um, and uh, our team is chewing in on the engineering, the environmental, uh, the exploration as we uh, take it forward. And we think this will be uh, one of the U.S. Uh, next big gold producers. And we're taking it forward with that, uh, with that ambition. Excellent. Well, we wish you the best of luck on your endeavor. And thank you so much for sponsoring our podcast. It means a lot to us. And we've really enjoyed the conversations over the last couple of months. And if people want to find you online, it's revival-gold.com. That's right. And we're on the, the Venture Exchange uh, RVG uh, and uh, the OTC QX market, RVLGF. Okay, excellent. Thank you once again, Hugh, for joining the podcast. And we will speak to you again soon. Thank you, Adrian. And turning to the website in Peru, they have an election. And it is neck and neck. It's by Tom as a party. And he files quite a few reports for us from Central and South America. A surprise win by a left-wing candidate in the first run of Peru's presidential elections has alarmed foreign investors and the mining sector. But the bigger threat could be the continuation of the political gridlock that has gripped the country since 2017. Having emerged the most popular candidate among a record field of 18 candidates, Pedro Castillo a former primary school teacher and union leader, remains the favorite to win a runoff vote on June 6th. His rival, conservative Kiko Fujimori, has worked hard to close the double-digit lead that opened immediately after the April 11th elections, but appears to have run into a ceiling of support. Claudia Navis, an analyst at Control Risk, told the Northern Miner in an interview on May 26th. For now, the poll results are too varied to judge who will win. While a May 21st poll by Ipsos Peru gave Castillo a four percentage point lead over Fujimori, one undertaken four days later by Lima-based market research firm Datum International and Gestion Newspaper reduced that gap to just one point. The uncertainty is causing sleepless nights for investors alarmed by Castillo and his Peru Libre Party's radical political program, which includes tearing up Peru's 1993 conservative constitution hiking taxes, and nationalizing strategic businesses, including major mines. And skipping down a few paragraphs, but while voters may be focused on his welfare measures for investors, the concern is the promise in Castillo's party program to nationalize the country's richest mineral assets, including Southern Copper's Quahone Mine, the Antamina deposit owned by BHP, Glencore Tech, and Camasi the country's largest natural gas field. Although he has cooled his rhetoric on nationalizations in recent weeks as he strives to attract undecided electors, promising higher taxes rather than expropriation, what he would actually do if elected remains unclear. Quote, I don't think he even knows how he is going to change the rules. And quote, Genia Forno, a mining lawyer at Rubio Leguia, Norman, told the Northern Miner on May 24th. And finally, the uncertainty comes at a critical time for the country's mining industry, which is already the world's second largest source of copper and a major producer of gold, silver, lead, zinc, and tin. Following the recovery in metal prices from 2017 onwards, investment reached a record $1.4 billion last year thanks to major copper projects like Anglo-Americans Quilavico and Mina Justa, owned by tin miner Minsur and Chile's Empresses Copac. With copper prices now at record levels, many companies are eyeing further investments, which could lift production to over 3 million tons annually over the next decade. And skipping down a bit, we have a quote from Tinker Resources CEO Graham Carman, and he says, quote, Leftist presidents elected in the past have realized quickly how important mining is to the economy, end quote. And a final quote from Control Risks. Quote, we think whoever wins will find it very hard to finish their mandate because of the gridlock in the legislature. So exciting times. June 6th is the time of the election. So that is coming up. Also in Latin America, Bolsonaro vows to keep mining out of Yanomami Reservation. So that means he will not mine in the Yanomami area. And this is by Cecilia Jamazmi. President Jair Bolsonaro 
of Brazil promised the Yonamami indigenous people that he would respect their wishes to keep mining out of their reservation in the Amazon, though he still plans to use other indigenous lands for commercial agriculture and mining. In a video released late on Sunday, the former army captain is seen talking to indigenous leaders in Maturaca, an Amazon village at the western end of the Yanomami reservation. And he said in the video, quote, if you do not want mining, there will be no mining. There are indigenous brothers in other places, inside and outside the Amazon, that do want mining, that want to cultivate the land, and we are going to respect their wishes. So finally, Bolsonaro's remarks come amid allegation that the tribe's lands are being seized while they themselves have come under attack from illegal miners known locally as Garimperos. So interesting developments there. Bit of a wait and see on that front. This is an interesting issue that I always come back to. Ontario injects funds into Frontier Lithium's processing pilot. I'm big on these private-public partnership deals. As anyone who listens to this podcast will know, I'd rather see a little bit of government money go into these things and they get built rather than we waiting for a mythical investor that is not interested in the project and it never gets built. So let's take a closer look. Cecilia Jamazmi again. Frontier Lithium said the Ontario government is injecting $363,000 into the company's pilot of a proprietary process that seeks to overcome certain risks linked to conventional lithium chemical processing used commercially outside North America. So in other words, they are testing a new process to process lithium. The company aims to become a fully integrated lithium producer of battery quality lithium, a critical component in the batteries that power electric vehicles and high-tech devices, And we have a quote from Frontier Lithium President and CEO Trevor Walker. This strategic investment strengthens Frontier Lithium's ability to assess new and emerging technologies so that we can best deliver high-quality lithium battery materials while reducing waste and energy. This timely support of the Ontario government further reinforces our vision and value proposition to build an integrated local mining and battery materials supplier for the electric vehicle industry from one of North America's largest and high-grade lithium resources. So that looks promising, and we have Greg Rickford, Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines, quote, we are investing in innovative mining and refining technology developed right here in Northern Ontario. There is a growing global market for reliable, responsibly sourced critical minerals, and we want Ontario to be the first jurisdiction on everyone's mind. So very interesting. I think this is fantastic because I don't think we have time to dilly around and wait for another investor presentation at PDEC in 2024 to fund your pilot. Just get the thing done. Get the thing done. And they are. This is music to my ears. I mean, maybe you out there have different opinions. Feel free to leave a comment. Do I have this wrong? But I think this is just great news because we just got to get it done. And finally, the lithium outlook is bright as ever, according to Fitch. By Henry Lazenby, over the next 10 years, the outlook for the lithium sector is, quote, as bright as ever amid fast production and demand growth, a new report from Fitch Solutions and Country Risk shows. The global acceleration towards decarbonization, the electrification of vehicles and energy storage continues. It provides a backdrop for fast-paced change in a market traditionally dominated by only a handful of participants and opening up many new production opportunities elsewhere in the world. However, the constant technological advancement on both the supply and demand sides pose risks to the market outlook. Fitch cautions that since lithium is now considered a, quote, strategic mineral, it will likely lead to rising government intervention in its production and sourcing. And we just saw that. This lithium supply landscape will therefore evolve quickly and dramatically over the next few years. So read all about that. There is a lot more. I just sort of whetted your appetite on that one. But if you actually want to go into the numbers, it is all laid out there. We even got a couple of charts there. Lithium outlook bright as ever, according to Fitch. So those are your news stories. Now let's turn to metal prices. Website, we'd like to thank our friends at mining.com slash markets for providing us with these prices each and every week. And on May 25th, 
Gold is trading at $1,913.73 per ounce. That is $28 higher than last week's quote, breaking $1,900. Silver is trading at $28.34 per ounce. That is 61 cents higher than last week's quote. Platinum is trading at $1,194.24 per ounce. That is $12 higher than last week's quote. And palladium is trading at $2,862.60 per ounce. That is $100 higher than last week. And turning to our industrial metals, copper is trading at $4.61 per pound. That is seven cents higher than last week. And aluminum is unchanged at $1.09 per pound. And lead is a penny lower at a dollar per pound. And nickel is 35 cents higher at $8.08 per pound. And tin is also higher at $15.18 per pound. That is 50 cents higher than last week's quote, and cobalt is unchanged at $19.78 per pound, and zinc is at $1.38 per pound. That is three cents higher than last week. I do believe for the two years that we've been recording metal prices here, that is an all-time high, so zinc on a tear. Overall, stepping back, what do we see? Definitely gold and silver continuing their uptrend. Platinum and palladium showing strength, also going along for the ride. And our industrial metals showing a lot of, again, wind in their sails, either unchanged or a little higher. And zinc with a little bit of a standout, zinc and tin, again, these very industrial metals uh, leading the charge. And those are your metal prices. And coming up, we have our... Feature keynote speaker from the Global Mining Symposium, David Garfalo, who is chairman and CEO of Gold Royalty Corporation. And he is also chairman and CEO of the Marshall Precious Metals Fund and chair of the board of Great Panther Mining Limited. And he is interviewed by Henry Lazenby, our new reporter at the Northern Miner, and he also contributes to mining.com. So here it is, David Garofalo and Henry Lazenby talk mining at the Global Mining Symposium. It's a great pleasure to welcome and introduce our keynote speaker, David Garofalo. Uh, David currently serves as chairman and CEO of Gold Royalty Corp. He's chairman and CEO of the Marshall Precious Metals Fund and chair of the board of Great Panther Mining. Uh, David is perhaps best remembered for his recent role as president and CEO and director of Gold Corp from 2016 to 2019. Before that, he also served as the president and CEO and as a director of Hud Bay Minerals from 2010 and as a senior vice president, CFO and director of Agnico Eagle from 1998 onwards. He has also been treasurer of Inmet Mining from 1990. David has also served on many public company boards over his career. But perhaps most important of all, uh, he was recognized as the Northern Miners Mining Person of the Year in 2012. Thanks for making the time to be here today, David. Thanks for having me on, Henry. As we've just heard, uh, David is currently the chairman and CEO of Gold Royalty Corp and chairman and CEO of the Marshall Precious Metals Fund. For the benefit of our audience, would you please just give us a brief introduction to these two vehicles and how they are positioned to create value for owners in the current economic uh, situation? Sure. I mean, Gold Royalty just IPO'd on the NYSC under the symbol GROYGROY in March. We raised $90 million US and uh, we have a post money valuation of about $200 million US uh, uh, post the IPO. Um, and we have a collection of 18 royalties on uh, properties throughout the Americas. Uh, most of them are in the development stage. Uh, and many of them are owned by our parent company, Gold Mining, which still retains a 48% interest in the company. And uh, what we've done is we've not only collected 18 royalties uh, on those development stage gold and copper assets throughout the Americas, but we've also 
accumulated a fairly impressive board of management with collectively 250 years of operating experience. And, and I want to emphasize that it is operating experience as opposed to financial um, experience or capital markets experience. We have that in spades as well. Uh, but together with myself, with over 30 years of experience on the operating side, I have Alan Hare, who was my successor at HUD Bay and, uh, uh, and also my C chief operating officer uh, when I was running HUD Bay. Uh, he brings over 35 years um, as a metallurgical engineer uh, to the table, and he's a prolific mind builder. Ian Telfer is the chair of our advisory board. Ian pioneered, of course, the streaming model with wheat and precious metals 15 years ago. And what we're doing with gold royalties, essentially replicating that model. You know, Wheaton was spun out initially with royalties on Gold Corp's uh, portfolio of operations and development stage projects. And we're doing exactly the same thing. We're getting spun out from gold mining. Uh, they have a dozen development stage assets throughout the Americas with collectively 26 million ounces of gold resource and over 31 million ounces on a gold equivalent basis when you add in the uh, significant copper byproduct. So we have this foundational element of resource to start us off. And now with $90 million on the balance sheet, which is the largest treasury among the sub $1 billion market cap royalty companies, we have quite a bit of ammunition to go out and start to diversify our portfolio on the royalty side. Uh, with Marshall, uh, Marshall was a, a fund that I started with uh, Zhao Jin Mining out of China. Uh, Zhao Jin was looking to create an incubator fund to invest in gold juniors. Uh, and so we set, set up a standalone fund. It's autonomous from Zhao Jin. Zhao Jin capitalized us initially with 20 million of their own capital. We raised $5 million from a couple of other partners in Hong Kong. And we've been systematically putting that capital work on the junior gold side. And you know, for the people that have known me in my previous um, employees with uh, Ignico, with Hud Bay, um, and most recently Gold Corp, I've always been a big proponent of investing in the juniors and kind of setting up that kind of incubation model. And that's precisely what we're doing here. Um, and it's, I think, timely, uh, given that we're starting to see um, a restart or a reignition of exploration on the gold side over the last year or so. And it's much needed in the sector. The dynamic that drove me to this end of the spectrum, both on the royalty and on the Marshall Precious Metals side, was one where I saw reserves declining by 40% in the gold industry over the last seven years. And I saw an absolute existential need for the industry to reinvest back in exploration and development. So royalty companies and investment funds focused on gold exploration are absolutely uh, vital uh, to reversing that downward trajectory in reserves and uh, you know, reinvesting back in the ground, which the industry desperately requires. So this really segues into the timing of the IPO too for uh, for the Gold Royalty Corp. Yeah. So, so you know, again, um, the spin out from gold mining was uh, was really focused on daylighting value in those development stage assets that gold mining had uh, by writing royalties on each of them. Um, that gives gold mining um, financial firepower to invest back on in the ground in these development stage assets. There's a dearth of these development stage assets. And what I recognize in gold mining that had been inventorying these assets through the bottom of the cycle, they were bought effectively at 10 cents on the dollar. I saw a lot of potential for outside capital to be deployed into them. And I thought as that happened, they would get re-rated within gold mining's portfolio. And by extension, gold royalty, having a royalty on these assets would enjoy that re-rate. So there's a lot of organic growth in terms of the value and the resource on those uh, on those royalties that we own on those development stage assets, and as I said, it's timely now because the industry is going to have to refine their skills on mine development and exploration, which has you know been largely underutilized over the last six or seven years, and and the result of that has been this downward uh, trend in reserves. Right. So following the IPO, Gold Royalty reached agreement with Rock Gold uh, to acquire 1.2 percent NSR on the advanced stage Seguela project in the Ivory Coast for 15.5 million uh, US. Recently, the Northern Miner quoted uh, Wheaton's uh, chief Randy Smallwood as saying the metal streaming deal opportunity landscape has never really looked better. What are your thoughts on how the landscape for new deals look like for a gold world support right now? Well, I couldn't agree more with Randy, and that's why I'm positioning myself um, at that end of the spectrum at this point in my career. Uh, I think royalty companies are an important part of the ecosystem when it comes to developing new mines. And with the resurgence in base metal prices, in particular copper and gold being at $1,900 an ounce, 
And again, given the existential need to start to reinvest back in exploration and development for gold companies, uh, you know, we think that there's going to be a scramble for assets and for capital to develop those assets. And royalty companies have always provided a meaningful source of capital. In fact, when I was running HUD Bay, and I'm glad you bring up Randy, uh, I was building the Constancia mine along with Alan Hare in, in Peru. And uh, we were, you know, a billion and a half dollar market cap company, and we had a $2 billion project to build. Uh, we had to be innovative in our financing, and that meant picking up the phone and calling Randy Smallwood and saying, what would you pay me for my 5% uh, stream on Constancia? 5% of our revenue was gold and silver. And ultimately, we raised about three quarters of a billion dollars uh, doing that towards the development of that project. And that was a win-win in that, you know, Randy uh, arguably was training at two times NEV at the time. He paid me roughly one times NEV for that stream when the company, Hud Bay, was trading at about half of NEV because uh, base metal companies typically are quite severely discounted in the market. I and mean, we weren't exactly at the peak of the cycle when we were building this. And so it was a win for, for us. It was a win for him because he got that stream re-rated within his portfolio two times. And we got the mine built, which is a generational asset now in HUD base portfolio. So it's very, very important to, to be positioned to provide that capital. And, and I think royalty companies by and large can source capital much more cheaply in the equity markets than the established producers can, even the senior producers. And it's that arbitrage opportunity that really creates value for both uh, the, the royalty shareholders and Gold Royalty Corp, and also for the operating companies that can sell those streams at multiples superior to what they are uh, currently getting in the marketplace. So the gold mining space recently came out of one of the longest bear markets ever, uh, which was partially the function of uh, widespread value destruction that followed the prior cycle. Looking at the industry today, in general, from a high level, uh, what are some of your key frustrations with the major and mid-tier actors? And perhaps conversely, um, are there any areas that are getting right these days uh, compared with prior cycles? Yeah, so I wouldn't call it frustrations. Let's characterize them as observations. And, and what I would say from a positive observation standpoint, this industry has never been healthier financially. They're profitable. Uh, they're deleveraged. In fact, we're at net zero debt as an industry, which I've never seen in over 30 years in the business. And they're, they're paying dividends and uh, buying back stock and, and doing all the right things in terms of harvesting their existing business. Uh, what the industry hasn't done is reinvest meaningfully back in exploration and development. As I said, mine building um, has become a lost art. There hasn't been any major mine construction on the gold side. And the, the result of that um, uh, is, is inevitable. Uh, production is declining. Reserves have declined. Reserves are a leading edge uh, and leading indicator of what will happen to production. So we have seen peak gold supply. Uh, gold production will be coming down. It will be coming down for at least the next decade because we all recognize that even if something major were discovered tomorrow uh, of significant resource, it would take a minimum of 10, 15, 20 years to bring back into production. And um, I'd say the same dynamic is occurring in the base metal space. And so what's inevitable is this, the type of cost inflation that we saw 10 years ago when we came out of the credit crisis, when there was massive amounts of development occurring both on the base and precious side. On the precious side, because gold had a, a big run um, post the credit crisis. On the base side, because we were in the middle of the Chinese super cycle and we saw very high copper prices. So we were at the center pricing for both copper and gold. And what happened is both the base and precious producers were allocating massive amounts of capital to new mine construction. They strapped on a lot of debt and we saw massive cost inflation. And so what came out of that is obviously, you know, the shareholders were disillusioned. They, they, they did not achieve the leverage they were looking for um, in the equities, both on the base and precious side and said, you know, I think quite rightfully focused on harvesting a good return from what we've already built, start returning some capital to shareholders. But I think we've overcompensated now. We've overdone it. And um, what will happen now is inevitable with copper prices at all time highs, with gold at incentive price levels and with reserves down 40% of production declining, there's going to be an overcompensation in both the base and precious side. And we're going to see massive amounts of mine development again uh, to compensate for that. We are going to see cost inflation. And the dynamic that's going to drive that cost inflation is partly because of the overcompensation I talked about, but also because we're in an inflationary environment in the general economy globally. Um, we're seeing headline inflation numbers 
uh, rear their ugly heads again. And that was inevitable because we've been in a quantitative easing cycle for about a dozen years since the last credit crisis in 2009. There's been a massive amount of stimulus. We've had exceedingly low interest rates for a long period of time, really negative rates. And what's inevitable is that will lead, lead to a, um, a cycle of hyperinflation in the general economy. But uh, you couple that with the need for the mining industry to start to invest back in the ground. And we're seeing that in the exploration side where there's a rush to explore and assay labs are backlogged and drilling companies are taking each other over. We're going into a big inflationary cycle on the mining side as well. Well, your above comments really segues into my next question. Um, Barry Gold, CEO Mark Bristow, recently had some pointed words directed at fund managers who he said, we're not investing in growth projects uh, when the industry was performing relatively well, like now. Uh, do you agree with those uh, sentiments and that not enough funding is flowing through to worthy development projects? And um, well, just an observation, we are still seeing the good projects attracting the required funding. So what are your thoughts on, on those comments? Brad? Yeah, look, I, I, I entirely agree with Mark. There, there isn't that long-term focus uh, in the fund management community uh, that's required for development. As I said, the lead times for mine construction can typically be 15 to 20 years from discovery. It requires some patient capital. Um, but I, I don't say that to vilify fund managers. In fact, I wish there were more fund managers that we could talk to. The reality is exceedingly and increasingly, we're seeing more and more capital go passive. So there's nobody to talk to. Um, you know, it, it, throughout my career, I've had many, many fund managers who've been quite supportive of our growth initiatives, um, investing long-term. A lot of those fund managers are out of business or out of work or retired, um, and they've been replaced by machines. And the reality is uh, machines uh, are focused on short-term metrics, price to cash flow, price to earnings. They're not necessarily focused on long-term value creative NAV growth that requires patient investment and exploration and development. So that's a very difficult dynamic for the mining industry. And I would say that's part of the reason that we've seen such a downward and dramatic trajectory in reserves over the last seven, eight years is because of that lack of patient capital, that lack of uh, of um, discretionary capital, if you will, to invest back in the space. And I apologize for my dogs barking in the background, but I think that's a phenomenon that everybody experiences during the pandemic. So it's a sign of our times. Right? That's the mailman coming. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so, so those were some of the easy questions. Um, allow me to throw you some curveballs. Uh, sure. Many of the prominent market commentators and gold bugs have long, as, as long called for the gold price to top. Uh, US $5,000. From your perspective, uh, what is preventing the gold price from breaking through the current resistance levels? And, and why have we not really seen 5,000 gold yet? I think there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one is the general equity markets are still quite robust. Um, they're doing very, very well. There's, there's a lot of paper in the system. And right now uh, it's chasing equities in a variety of sectors. And we're seeing uh, valuations that are distorted at the levels that we've never seen before in the general equity markets. Uh, it's due for a correction, and I think gold will be a benefit beneficiary of, of that. The other thing is, quite frankly, and I get this, I get this question quite a bit about cryptocurrency. You know, Bitcoin has eaten our lunch a bit, and that's the reality. And and the reason that is is because uh, there's a new class of investors, younger investors, that understand implicitly and instinctively that you know uh, that their fiat currencies are being undermined, and they want to protect their assets. And so Bitcoin has created a solution of scarcity, but, and it is an illusion, uh, you know, and, and, and it's not to say that cryptocurrencies aren't here to stay. I think they are. I think they are here to stay. They're going to be a fundamental part of the whole blockchain phenomenon. We need digital currencies in order to participate in that, that market. But the reality is there is no barriers to entry in the cryptocurrency market. You know, this Doge coins come out and suddenly captured the attention. So when you have that kind of, upward and violent move in valuations on what I think is just zeros and ones, there are going to be other market entrants that are going to try to take advantage of that. And that undermines the whole scarcity proposition that the Bitcoin advocates are trying to, uh, to put out there into the market. The reality is gold is very, very scarce. Um, it's 200,000 metric tons that have been mined since the beginning of time, fits into four Olympic sized swimming pools. What's more scarce than that? We're only mining as an industry 4,000 tons per year. Uh, there's huge barriers to entry into the industry. 
It's very capital intensive. There's a remarkable inelasticity to supply to price. We've actually seen supply go down as the price has gone up just because of how difficult it is to bring new production on. So that's the true currency. That's That's got scarcity and it's got physical scarcity. Bitcoin has zero scarcity. It's anybody can invent a cryptocurrency. And, and that's really what's going to undermine that market at the end of the day. It's here to stay, but at, not at these valuations. It's ridiculous. So switching gears a little bit again, uh, the advent of ESG-based investment principles has also contributed to a changing financial uh, landscape for gold miners and developers. Um, just this week, the Northern Miner reported on Osisco Group's uh, Sean Rusin as saying ESG has in fact done a bit of a disservice to exploration and development investment in Canada, especially in the far north, given all the keyboard bureaucracy involved. In your experience, has ESG resulted in less or more investment flowing to any level of the gold sector? Um, has it made life better or more difficult in general? Well, it's definitely increased the cost of capital, but I, I don't want to whine about it because it's probably uh, done that for many industries um, in, in many sectors. It's not just the mining industry. And look, ESG has to be absolutely intrinsic to everything we do. We have to be able to, to uh, engage stakeholders early on from the first drill hole when we're first exploring properties. Uh, we have to use less water. We have to drive down our water intensity. We have to drive down our energy intensity. These are just the fundamentals of how to do business in the world today, regardless of what sector you're in. Yes, it's driven up the cost of doing business, but it's, it's done that for, uh, for many, many industries. But we can't ignore it. The, the areas I think we need to focus on as an industry, because I don't think we're terribly energy intensive. I think we're becoming less intensive uh, from an energy standpoint. We're not the significant emitters that many other industries are. And in fact, we're starting to see more electrification of mines. When I was running Gold Corp, we built Board Mine, the first all-electric mine, uh, underground mine. Um, so that equipment is being scaled and rescaled and, and becoming much more economic uh, as it's being uh, commercially used. So I see the prospect for us to drive down carbon emissions is very, very uh, high. I think we'll be able to do that as an industry. I'm very, very confident in our ability to drive down our, our our carbon emissions. Where we really need to focus on is our water consumption. Uh, I still think that we're laggards in terms of our water recycling. I think traditional tailings facilities are hugely water intensive and also have a lot of stigma associated with them. Uh, we need to go to far more efficient uh, uh, ways to manage our tailings, uh, whether it's dry stack as really our base case, so that we drive down, not only drive down water consumption, but make our tailings inert and much less harmful to the environment um, if there were a breach in our tailings facilities. So th there's lots that can be done. And that technology is being scaled very, very quickly and dramatically because the filter presses are getting bigger and more efficient. Uh, but we need to focus, I think, if anything, on water consumption. And the reality is wars are fought over water. And if you want to get the social license to operate from the surrounding communities, you have to be seen as efficient and responsible stewards of water. I think that's more critical than our, our ability to drive down carbon emissions as an industry. And so given that fewer uh, major discoveries are being made and grades are falling, would you say the world has seen peak gold production yet? Y yeah, it is. I, I think we're, we're past peak gold now. I think we're in a, a period of steady decline. Uh, and I don't think that trajectory gets reversed anytime soon, just again, given the long lead times uh, from discovery to, to new production. You know, I see a lot of promising projects and, and I'm very excited what's happening in the junior side. I'm glad that they're able to raise money again, uh, though, albeit I'd say selectively. I don't think there's a broad based generalist flood of capital going into the junior space, but some of the better juniors with great track records are able to raise capital. But we're not going to see the, the benefit of their exploration efforts, the fruits of their efforts for many years to come. So it's absolutely vital uh, for the industry for them to be successful. So in your opinion, should gold companies go after copper the way Newmont says it's doing? Uh, we just saw it pick up GT Gold and the Tatoga of uh, porphyry copper gold prospects in uh, British Columbia. Would you say there's merit in that strategy? Yeah, look, I, I think, um, you know, there's there's this um, legendary gold multiple and, and uh, Pierre Lassonde articulates this far better than I do. But I'd say there's a lump, upper limit to how much byproduct credit that you can have in your portfolio beyond gold before you start to, to lose that uh, that superior multiple that gold companies typically enjoy. And, and I think the rule of thumb is, you know, probably 
25% byproduct credit. You know, and, and quite often, look, the best gold deposits are in our polymetallic settings. Um, Agnico was built on the Laurent mine, which in the early years was predominantly zinc. And as we got deeper, um, we it became much more gold oriented. But, you know, we, we were able to suspend disbelief in the market when I was there with Sean uh, about the amount of zinc we had because we said, you know, there's more gold coming. Uh, but eventually, investors see through that. They, they need to. Uh, they need. They, they want focused companies uh, that are singularly focused on on uh, certain metals, so they understand what they're buying. And so, they think there is an upper limit to what you can do in terms of diversifying away from uh, the metal that uh, investors are buying you for. So, perhaps just to drill down on some of the points that we have touched on uh, during our conversation now, I wanted to just ask you to remind our audience about why the royalty and metal streaming models make so much more sense from a returns perspective than the traditional miners. Well, look, I, you know, the way I look at it, and I've heard Randy Smallwood use this line, so I, I'll attribute it to him, is it's like kind of buying an ETF with expiration upside. You know, you can buy the GLD and get the physical. Uh, physical exposure and the leverage of the gold price in doing that, but you don't get the expiration upside. And that's typically why people buy gold equities. You know, they're looking for that leverage proposition of profitability and expiration that the equities can provide. But the operators also have risk. You know, they have underlying operating cost risk, uh, capital cost risk, and as those uh, risks manifest themselves in, in the form of inflation, that erodes uh, the, the profitability leverage, it erodes the margins. And so by having top line exposure um, through uh, royalty companies, you get the best of all worlds, in my view. You get both the uh, leverage to the gold price and leverage to the expiration success of our underlying operating partners. And, and I think that's really why that model is appealed over the long run uh, through the ups and downs of the cycle. And uh, looking at the M&A environment uh, today, uh the real cycle started with uh, Rand Gold and Barrick's uh, tie up uh, in, late in 2018, and then also followed by Newmont Gold Corp's uh, tie up. Uh, how would you characterize uh, further potential for market consolidation today uh, across the tiers? Look, I, I'd say the seniors are pretty much done. You know, Barrick did Rand Gold, Newmont had to react. It was an existential threat to them to have Barrick become uh, considerably bigger. And so that's it was the genesis of the conversations we had. And now they're positioned uh, at the top of the heap with barracks, you know, nipping at their heels. I don't see any real scope for any consolidation up at the very top. You know, they're both at sustainable production levels now with vastly diversified portfolios as a result of those uh, mergers that they took respectively. I'd say there's lots of scope in the mid tier and the emerging producer side, there's too many of them. And scale is important. Uh, we've seen a number of deals that have happened in, in the space, but there's scope for quite a bit more. And the reality is if you want to attract that general investor, you need to provide liquidity. And to provide liquidity, you need scale. The way to choose scale quickly to, to attract that general's capital is through M&A. Uh, it will happen. I think there's a lot of pent up M&A um, that's likely to be unleashed in the coming months as we come out of the pandemic crisis and people are able to conduct physical due diligence again. So, you know, watch the space. In the royalty space, uh, there's been a proliferation of sub $1 billion royalty companies over the last couple of years. Too many of them, again, there's going to be a reckoning there. There's going to be consolidation. Um, you know, the reason I equip my board with such a senior team with many, many decades of experience at each, respectively, in 250 years collectively, is, you know, I'm looking to leverage the Rolodex as much as leveraging the gold price, um, you know, having access to opportunities and, and looking at opportunities for consolidation is really important to get that re-rate in the marketplace. You want to advance your assets, uh, de-risk them, and get a re-rate that way, but you also get a re-rate through scale. And I think m is inevitable in the royalty space as it is in the mid-tier and emerging producer space on the gold uh, gold equity side. Perfect. All right. Uh, with that, that's the end of my questions. Uh, let's open it up to the floor. I have one question here from Milka Rivera. He's asking, do your companies consider investing in private companies only or public listed companies? Well, if they're talking about the Marshall Fund, uh, we're focused exclusively on, on public companies or companies that are on the cusp of IPOing uh, or going public through reverse takeover. Uh, liquidity is extremely important to us, important to our unit holders uh, as we have to mark to market our portfolio every quarter. On the gold royalty side, you know, we're happy to take royalties back on privately owned assets and, and um, 
we're actively looking for ones um, of that type um, as I speak. So absolutely. Are there any specific uh, regions that you favor? I would say in both vehicles, uh, I assume it's it's for both, it, we're quite agnostic. We're more focused on uh, the quality of the geological model and focused on the management teams. Um, do they have the track record of being successful in those jurisdictions? So I'd say in both of my vehicles, we have uh, given our, you know, one degree of separation from being on the ground, both in terms of the investment fund and the royalty uh, royalty company, is a, a bit more tolerance for ge geopolitical risk, as long as the geology and the quality management justifies it. That's all from me. Thank you very much for your time, David. I do appreciate it. And with that, I'll send it back to Anthony. found that part about water super interesting how you know as far as environmentalism is concerned like stop wasting water <laughs> it was uh that was an eye-opener you know the, the sort of thing you get from someone who actually works in the business not some pontificator on his armchair speaking into his microphone anyway thank you everyone for joining us once again thank you to henry and to david and to hugh we've got lots more coming up in the coming weeks if you want to help out the podcast leave us a review in the apple podcast directory and until next week take care this episode of the northern miner podcast is brought to you by revival gold and their bear track arnett gold project in idaho if you want to learn more about revival gold you can find them at revival gold.com and you can find them on the TSX Venture Exchange at RVG and on the over-the-counter markets at RVLGF.